Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this birthday lecture to discuss a very important, pertinent issue. We are as a continent mentor. She promoted the vision and mission of our association during its formative years five decades ago. She has been actively involved from its inauguration in 1977 to the call of M1 Lagos president from 1991 to 1993. She offered part of her private facility at Pesuno Lagos for cancer screening services and also to mentor to the acquisition of permanent building for the association. She implemented regular enlightenment programs on women and children. No wonder she deserves to be graciously celebrated with this special birthday lecture in recognition of her great passion for passion and with the body. Hence, the choice of this active sexual and gender-based violence a case of mental and sexual health emergency in Nigeria. We are highly honored to have a now keynote speaker, the Executive Secretary of Lagos State Sexual and Domestic Violence Agency, Mrs. Titilola Vaiko Adeniji, and erudite panelists. One of them is our Amazon sister, Dr. Manuna. So, Kajori, to do justice to the thing. I say the thing is very out at this period because of intensified different forms of violence, experienced especially gender based violence, with attendant challenges of COVID 19 pandemic a few years ago, with global lockdown, locked in with movement restrictions, gender based violence that is DPD was labeled as a shadow pandemic by the United Nations. In its diverse forms, rape, sexual assault, domestic violence, intimate partner rape, child marriage, etc. have negative impacts which affect the society at large. Almost everyone suffers either physically, mentally, Socially, psychologically, and emotionally, leading to disharmony and disunity, not just between individuals, but also affecting both genders. Sequel to this, many lives have become meaningless, post dashed, livelihood destroyed, civil parenthood, even deaths, coupled with stigmatization of victims in the society, including schools. Severe mental health issues to depression, preventable emergencies, and even suicidal attempts by victims. M1 Lagos anti DDB campaign uses the acronym MASTERS as slogans for schools for ease of message spread and also kids against stigmatization of victims in the society. Anyone can be a victim of gender-based violence anytime, anywhere, and by anybody involving even our family members and the challenge. So speak out, speak up, and seek help. Some of these are reflected in the drama, video clip on gender-based violence acted by M1 Lagos Drama Group where I was the one that put on their brother. I was the husband, the rapist, the white eater. And the title is F Stop Gender Based Violence. This is what you think. Finally, let us come together to fight the battle. A task that must be done by everyone. Be it as mothers, as fathers, as grandparents, as brothers, as sisters, as nieces, as uncles, as policy makers, as law enforcement agents, as schools, artisans, professional bodies, traditional leaders, religious leaders, 
corporate bodies, government institutions, non-governmental organizations, and so on and so forth, to prevent the preventable and about mental health and sexual health emergencies with their life-threatening consequences. In that aspect, some other states have copied and are doing well. But where I want to focus on is the legal framework generally and why we have those problems. Firstly, Nigeria has, in essence, three legal systems. We have the English legal system, which are the laws that are enacted by our state assemblies and the federal government in Abuja. Statutes. We have our own customary laws based on our ethnic nationalities. Yoruba customary law for the Southwest, Igbo customary law for the Southeast. And for the North, their customary law is Islamic law. So when you have a clash between those three legal systems, is where we have areas where domestic violence is not properly covered. For instance, in the North, under the Penal Code, you are perfectly entitled to beat your wife, your child, your ward, your servant. If the beating is correct, it does not amount to previous bodily harm. So that is a lacuna. How far can you beat your wife? And it effectively means that under the penal code in the law, beating your wife is not domestic violence. This is why Wadidi also spoke about rape. Both in the north and the south, marital rape does not exist. You can't rape your wife. But in other countries, consent is consent. You can rape your wife if she refuses you sex and you force her. Our cultural background is that by marriage, you have submitted to your husband. And you hear this as well from the religious interventions because Mrs. Wifadini also mentioned the impact of religious leaders in domestic scenarios. Say, husbands, love your wife. Wife, submit to your husbands. And so the cultural issues are the issues that we need to address. In many cultures, what we classify to be correctly as domestic violence is not seen as domestic violence in our traditional upbringing. In many instances where you go to report your husband to his family because he beats you, they would not chastise him for beating you. They would chastise him for over beating you. And the first thing they will ask will be, Kilo Shefu, what did you do? Because there's an assumption that if you didn't do wrong, you wouldn't beat you. So to make our laws more effective, we actually need to approach our cultures and bring that training right down to the family unit. I, as I sit here today, if I said to my husband, I would be a mad man, like crazy, you are foolish. And he reported to his family. I will probably be back in my father's house before I can pat an idea. But if at the level of the woman who sells pepper, or sells fish in the market, she said exactly the same thing to her husband, and it was reported to his family, they wouldn't throw her out. They would just chastise her. She couldn't have said so, even no, no matter what he did, 
Okay, kneel down, apologize, beg him. So the essence of changing our cultural values is what is going to, in my opinion, that is what is really going to attack the scourge of domestic violence and sexual violence. We need to focus not just on the laws, but we also need to focus on our own cultural upbringing. And this is the uh, Adeni mentioned that at the end of her presentation, when she spoke about educating our boys. I see a lot of girls here today. It would have been nice if there were a lot more boys here. So that one could talk to them about what it means to be a man. It's not just the physical strength, the ability to put money down to maintain a wife that makes a boy a man. We saw the woman begging for her husband. Forgive him, forgive him. And that is where our cultural issues come into place. I'm sure that uh, this is why we are aware of so many instances where cases of sexual violence, sexual abuse, or domestic violence are reported to the police. And the police say it's a domestic matter, not a sexual abuse. That's one. Or secondly, somebody has raped a young girl. It's reported to the police. And the attitude of the police is not to prosecute. It's to sex you. The next thing you hear is, I'm not sex you. Okay, we will talk. And then they will speak to the accused person and advise his family to raise money to settle the complainant's family. So there's still a shortfall in the law, even in the hospitals. And then there's another aspect of it. For victims of the survivors, as we they like to call the survivors of domestic abuse, when they are taken out of that abusive environment, where do they go? We have remand homes for boys in the state. We have remand homes for girls. But those are correctional facilities for children and young persons. When you take young children out of an abusive environment, where are they going to be placed? My understanding is currently they can be put in like orphanages, uh, homes that are run by other charities. But if you want to have a robust legal intervention into this sector, then we need to look at actually establishing halfway homes where these children can be placed, where they can use these women or abused or the abused women or the abused men can also be placed because you can't take them out of an abusive environment and leave them hanging. They have to be somewhere. And you can't put them in a correctional center because they haven't been convicted of any offense. So where should they be placed? We need some sort of a shelter until they are reunited with their family members and they can go back to their mothers or go back to their uncles or something. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. that one day we can't really talk about when we, when we, when we bring about gender-based violence. Um, uh, Mrs. Um, Adeni really spoke about, from a place of knowledge, and she run the agency for a couple of years, and even sharing studies with us on what has been happening with uh, the Lagos State Agency when it comes to gender-based violence. This has been ongoing for so many years. And of course, we know the culture of silence is our biggest barrier. Biggest barrier because we are in a system whereby people 
are not encouraged to speak up and speak out. And even if you speak up, it's very easy for people to trivialize your issues and they tell you that everybody is dealing with the same thing. Why is your own different? And we are in a society whereby um, denial is also uh, the order of the day, and of course, very easy to, you know, cancel you out. We have young people here. We have a council function where it doesn't really that why are you talking about certain things that does, doesn't really matter. Of course, the COVID-19 came in 2020 and with the advent of COVID-19, we saw that the first year of COVID-19, there was an increase, in fact, 25% increase in anxiety and depression globally. And the people that were most affected were our children and women. And we, we, we also want everybody to understand that one of the biggest factors, the perpetuating factor, apart from the lockdown, the isolation that happened, gender-based violence was also the order of the day. Bringing it home for somebody like me that run a mental facility. We had less than 5% of children reporting to our center before the advent of COVID-19. But currently we have over 25% of adolescents between the ages of 13 to 19 reporting cases of uh, being in a hostile environment and being in toxic relationship. And what does that mean? That means our parenting is not that we are not good, but because of the fact that, you know, we have this, I'm a parent, I can't say anything, you don't need to speak. Whatever I say, is you must answer. And of course, the fact that you know parents are also very quick to like, look, I pay your school fees, I do this, I pay your no. You have a roof over your head, I put food on the table. So whatever, your only one goal in life is to go to school and have good grades. But what if that child is being sexually abused? And of course, we understand that perpetrators are the people that these children know. Majority of over 85% are people that they know. So when we come to the mental health, I'm going to call up, you know, talk about from an array from the youngest. And I, and I love the fact that this is, I think talked about the fact that somebody in diaper and as old as 79, I think, there about, I've seen an 81 year old woman who was sexually abused at the age of 12. So 70 years, she lived with this. She had three children. And what did she do? In, in trying to find closure. She never allowed any of her children to marry from that particular tribe. And these children never knew that was the reason. But at the age of 81, in the Maslow hierarchy of needs, she has achieved a lot. She's one woman who said there's nothing she's looking for that she doesn't have. She achieved, achieved the highest in society, has, you know, living well, travel anywhere she wants to travel, just a snap of the finger. But why would she be clinically depressed at the age of 81? She never found closure. The man that raped her walked the street free for all those years before she he died. And at the point when he died, that was when there was that flashback of he, he has eventually died. But I never found help. I never found peace. I never found justice. And the children were wondering why would the mother be depressed? And by the time we dig that and we found why she was in that state, and of course with other compounding issues, they now realize this is why mommy never allowed us to marry from this particular tribe. They never knew until that day. And this is some, this is one of the several reasons why we have mental related issues when it comes to, to domestic violence. Of course, gender inequality is a major perpetrator. This year we all did embrace and equity. Such a lovely way. It's like hoping yourself, but well, is there equity? If, unless we have equity before we can have equality. Every organization right now is talking about diversity, equity, and inclusiveness. So everyone is like a wish list, stick it up, but are they even really practicing it? We have people in the workplaces that are having issues with sexual harassment, molestation, and everything. We have children in, in poor teachers that are sexually abusing them, and of course they cannot speak out because they are in an environment where the culture of silence is you know, highly perpetuated. Anxiety, depression, substance abuse are the top most mental and related challenges when it comes to uh, mental and related issues regarding gender-based violence globally. Of course, with Nigeria inclusive. You know, understanding their pain as against a point, a place of responding. We know you know it all, 
but understand them more from their place of pain. As against, and what do you mean? God said that I've seen the woman who was abusing, the husband was abusing her child, and she said, You want to start now my marriage. And of course, the thing is time management and structure. Put structure in homes where it is okay for children to talk to you, where it is okay for, 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 for you to create that whole climate that is happy, that is healthy, that everybody feels held, connected, empowered, and inspired. The eye is get your children to be inspired by you. Why should our children be saying that they are no more the business in Mandela that has died? Why should our children be talking about whiskey than the window? Why can't your child say you are his or our own role model? Create that environment where they get inspired and when there are issues that I'm talking to, tell your child the worst case that can happen to you is if you kill somebody and if you kill somebody, come and talk to you, find a way out. Thank you, doctor. And as far as the end is to control them well, and the team will never go well from the team. In Nigeria, we are very godly. Put God in everything you do, and of course, we challenge it. And above all this, let us be mindful of how we do things, and let us be more intentional in our parenting. And of course, with God, everything will be fine. Thank you. It has just been discussed. The importance of ensuring that she receives this, not just on one on one, but as we carry out at the Worry Free Crisis Center, in a group setting, on a monthly basis, so she recognizes that she's not alone. Outside of these services, at the center, we've been able to partner with other agencies and other nonprofit organizations to offer a welfare service that is as important as the other sister previously. She needs accommodation. If she's in a home at risk, where does she go? Many a time, we rely on our family members for support, but sadly not all of us have access to that. She needs legal aid, as discussed earlier, because she seeks justice, but perhaps she doesn't have the means. Where does she get the legal aid? If she's one that has not finished school, as we're aware, over 118 million out of school girls with 98 million are found in Sub-Saharan Africa, she needs a vocational skill. Women make poor choices because they're not financially empowered, not because they enjoy being in the situation they find themselves. These services and more are offered at the Rape Crisis Center, and we also recognize that beyond these services, we have women that do not and cannot reach a center like ours, or centers like ours in other parts of the country. And so we have to make sure we offer them a tool free line, so at least they can reach out, call confidentially, and have their needs attended to free of charge. When you offer these services, is it again an aspect that needs to be looked at, which is beyond the primary services that you offer? A follow-up care, a follow-up system. Women and girls that live in Nigeria do not have the luxury of going home and having a readily available pathway set up for them to continue to receive their care. And so we have to factor this in if we are committed to ensuring that her well-being is guaranteed. An example are the HIV tests that we offer. If sadly a woman is positive, then what happens? We have organizations like the National Institute of Medical Research, NIMA, who can continue to offer treatment at a subsidized rate. And this is a partnership that we've employed. We talk about psychosocial counseling. Some of these young women need inpatient care. And that's outside of the purview of many facilities like ours. So again, psychiatric hospitals play a big part in that. I mentioned unwanted pregnancies. My primary practice is um, obstetrics and gynecology. So I see teenage pregnancies, young girls that have now been forced to endure pregnancy after the horrific encounter. And again, they need the assistance. They need the care, and they need the care ready and made available to them. Beyond the mainstream healthcare that we provide, we must also remember the small and niche groups, women with disabilities, for instance. If a woman is disabled, how does she access a facility? Is that facility amenable to a wheelchair, for instance? Is she deaf? Because sadly, we do have many survivors that have hearing impairment. Do we have a sign language translator that is able to then sit with us and have a conversation with us. We must look at healthcare professionals inwards. 
we must make sure that we are attending to not just our training, but also our external psychosocial counseling, because it's a heavy task that we bear day in, day out, attending to these women. We must also make sure that we data collect. We live in a country, as I said, of 100 million women. We must keep track. We must make sure that we are aware of the numbers. We must have a needs assessment, but also we must have an idea of the impact. So we can say how well we're doing, how much more work needs to be put in. One organization like ours, with one facility in Yaba, have attended to almost 4,500 beneficiaries since 2017. These are numbers that can be tracked across other states and other facilities. So we have a better understanding of where we are and what we need to ensure that we leave no one behind. I recognize the BOT chairperson and members of the BOT, the National Advisory Committee of M1, the National Executive Council of M1, all M1 members, distinguished participants online, physical, and in diaspora. I thank you all, the organizer, for this robust webinar organized to celebrate our mother. She deserves it, she deserves more, as she has identified with the core values of everyone, and she also practices the motto, Martin Salino Quran, that is serving, loving, healing with the spirit of a mother. Today, the topic is very jabby. And as we, are all, as we have all realized, gender-based violence continues to be a challenge to Nigeria. Nigerian women and girls and families. And for this, all hands must be on deck to root it out from our society. I do agree with all aspects of this discussion, all the suggestions, all the questions and answers, and the participants, the panelists, they have done a good job. We would like the community to go around and to be domesticated. Our women and girls deserve to be respected and to be treated with dignity and treated with respect and love. We are not perfect, but we do not deserve to be physically and mentally abused. Can you hear me clearly? You are not perfect, but that does not mean you should physically and mentally abuse us. We hope that the perpetrators of GBV will seek opportunity of anger management and self-control. And it is one of the things we must put in place while treating our patients with GBV, that is to manage the perpetrators as well. We should resolve amicably without leaving any stone unturned. Finally, I'd like to call on the law enforcement agents to, uh, to root out the perpetrators, to bring them to justice so as to serve as deterrent to others. Again, government and other NGOs like F1 should set up groups for these victims, that is comfort stations, groups. What we need now are spaces, safe spaces. I understand that the women have here really sweet. They have set up spaces in about 20 states. We need to complete this to be 37, and we need to be all actively involved. Many of these victims, after treating them in hospitals or in the law chambers, we don't have spaces to put them. And these spaces, they call them safe spaces for security because of the insurgency, for the likelihood that the man or the perpetrator may come back again. So we need to create spaces, safe spaces for these GBV patients. And we have to identify strictly with the NGOs that are really out and ready to give us this opportunity. Again, I would like to thank all members I would like to say that I'm happy to be here. It's an opportunity, and many of our members are alive. I really congratulate Dr. Ibiru Keshubenge for being a strong anchor. I recognize Dr. Lak and Iba, Dr. Bimuna Kadri, Dr. Uh, Dr. Kenny Ibru, Barista Adekoya, and Mrs. Titi Lola Baibo. 
I didn't need you. I thank you. I thank you for giving me this space to say a few words. And in my capacity as the national president, can I call all of us to stand up while Mama sits down and we sing a song for her? For she's a jolly good friend. Please a jolly good friend. celebrate you and heartily congratulate you. May you live more to see more good years in good health, love, peace, fruitfulness, and hope. It gives me great pleasure to be here today. Even at my old age, when I don't know whether it's a young age, because I'm sure because of you, because of uh, better um, medical attention will be reaching, will reach 100 years first without being, uh, without being uh, conscious of their life, without being, without staying, staying in the house and not going out. Because I don't stay in the house, I go out when it is necessary. Because that's a, that's that's a, 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 a culture that we should. I think our people are the only one who do this. I am very happy today for all my children. I say children. You are all my children, and you turn me proud. I really enjoy everything, every aspect of this session. But one thing I want to add is. We still have to work hard. Women, women still have to work harder. Because in any case, you can work harder than, I'm not talking about physical, uh, you work now, but really physical, uh, mental, all sorts of things. When you think of it, every woman is a mother. Is an administrator. Is a driver. It's a, it's a watchman. It's everything. All men in the city want to work and come back. That's wonderful. But we do go on and we go back. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I know, I'm not talking about it. I'm just trying to say that women have not worked hard in the past and they're still working and they're still working. Even after this uh, program, uh, they missed, we, we did not miss it. I don't know what happened. We have not touched about uh, underage marriage. That still goes on in many of our states, especially in the North. Because at the end of it, because when I say underage, I'm not talking about 18, 15. I'm talking about eight, eight years, nine years. And, and then they ruin the life of that child. At the end of the day, the child suffers. At the end of the day, the child is a nobody. And I even understand that after the time, she's sent out of the house. Because they say, we do all these things to other people. Why is yours so different? Not knowing that we are not the same all the time. We have to focus. You know what I'm talking about, children uh, and my, my, my friends. BBF. BBF. You know, they just ruin the life of the child. Another thing I want to say is that I will love my, my children now. Many of them are grandchildren and mothers. Maybe great grandmothers too. I bet for, for that. Another thing I want to say is that. <coughs> When we, when, 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 uh, when we talk about women, you know, we talked about uh, men doing something to women, and what about doing something to 
the phone as you go. What do you need to do? Like when she comes in, she comes, she's tired. She wants to sleep. The children are there too. She has a lot of work to do. I think we work and we're doing it. I know that women work much harder than men. At the end of this day, this is the beginning. But the most important is that we should face this um, underage, and underage uh, marriage. It's not done in, in time. They do it openly. They, they do it openly. Because when, when we were going around, we went to the north and we saw these children. They are just at their operation, BBF operation. And you would know that they were children really. They were doing, you know, Ampe. Who knows Ampe? And another one just holding on to the uh, avatar that I just removed. And I said, My goodness. And yet, people know this and they do not, I, I, they do, not do anything about it. But, um, when, when we went to the north, and we saw this with these children, we almost cried. Some were already sent out, and such girls, how, what do you expect such girls to do? What do you expect them to do? Eh? They become harlots, and they become harlots and useless. So, as we are talking about this, I think we should a bit focus on it, because it's still going on. Even it's the father that will say, I give you my daughter, my underage daughter. Can you imagine that? That doesn't happen a lot in the south, but it's very prevalent in the north. Because when we left that place about many years ago, I kept on thinking, I said, people are not addressing this thing. And these children are suffering. They are suffering in the same house. So, if you if we need to write, my, my dear friend, we need to write, we write to them. They cannot deny it. So, they cannot deny that they are doing, they are doing it up till tomorrow. What for are you doing? Because if you read that child, let her go to the adult age. You can marry her yet now, not marry me at the seven, seven, seven year old age, we are old girl. They always do it. And we find that maybe the way not is responsible for my long age, but you contributed to it, didn't you? Because I was always with you and, and I would enjoy it. Professor. Uh, uh, okay.
the national president of the Medical Women Association of Nigeria, who joined us virtually, Dr. Mrs. Otolori, the president of the Medical Women Association of Nigeria, Lagos chapter, Dr. Mrs. Hiroke Shuden, my former boss, all the past presidents of the Medical Women Association of Nigeria who are present, and the entire Medical Women Association of Nigeria, I recognize you and I welcome you. And um, I'll read a speech. And I start. Permit me to begin on a congratulatory note by happily felicitating the revered Mama, an accomplished professional and a worthy leader, Dr. Mrs. Grace Simisola Olubao Pretoria, as it has pleased the Almighty God to spare her life to become a non-generian. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our sight. And I join family and friends to celebrate a mother indeed, a woman of refined, exemplary qualities. Ma, I thank God for your life, and I thank God for his abiding grace and faithfulness upon you and your family. The Breakland family is indeed an extraordinary family. Even as we celebrate the 90th birthday of Mama, we also pay glowing tribute to the contribution of the patriarch of this family, the late Dr. T.G. Braithwaite, who deployed law activism and politics to fight injustice and put our dear country on the path of sustained growth and development. Mama Mubamu Braithwaite remains a leading light and a shining example of everything good in the medical profession, particularly the Medical Women's Association of Nigeria which today continues to serve as a veritable platform to engender considerable improvements in medical services to the people. As a result of this hard work, dedication and passion of our founding mothers, including Mama Olubango Breakthrough, the Medical Women Association of Nigeria continues to attract a glittering reputation as a non-governmental, non-profit, non-sectarian and non-political organization of Nigerian female medical and dental practitioners that is at the forefront of championing various health-related initiatives to serve humanity in pursuit of positive health programs with special emphasis on women and children. It is therefore commendable that a memoir has been weaved together as chronicles from the crucible of a matriarch to bless the younger generation with real life lessons to draw inspiration and insights on the grace to conquer and navigate through the challenges of life. Thank you, Mommy, for this precious gift to humanity and happy birthday, Mom. It is also worthy of commendation that this birthday lecture is focused on sexual and gender-based violence, a case for mental health and sexual health emergency. Sexual abuse, especially as it concerns women and children, is an evil and bestial act, and it must not and cannot be tolerated. This has been the guiding philosophy behind our various interventions against the SGPP. In the last four years, the state government has put various measures in place to fight the menace headlong, name and shame the perpetrators, and ensure a legal framework to punish the perpetrators, while most importantly, working hard to prevent the crime. In the unfortunate events of such crimes, wherein they are ugly heads, the state government has also made adequate medical and psychological supports available to the victims with a way to ensure that they overcome the trauma and emotional damages that they may have been subjected to in the process of being abused. Another fact that has been established by empirical findings is that there is a clear and direct nexus between mental health and sexual abuse. Mental health 
issues have the capacity to push their victims into comm committing sexual and gender-based violence crimes. Conversely, the devastating consequences of suffering sexual abuse can trigger mental health issues for victims amongst others. This play underscores the fact that it is an issue that must not be trivialized or relegated. We must sustain the advocacy. We must work collaboratively to address mental health and sexual health. And we must continue to lead initiatives to read as society, to read as society of the millennials in order to create a better place for all of us and for our children. The solemn pledge of Mr. Babakide Olushala Sangolu is to sustain the various initiatives already in place against the menace and build on them to achieve better outcomes. On the final note again, I celebrate your mommy, Dr. Mrs. Grace Sinisola Olubao Greatly, and wish you many, many more years of impact so that the world can continue to benefit from your extensive, deep crucible. Happy birthday, mommy. Thank you very much. Dr. Mrs. Ibido Exxon, First Lady of the United States. Privileged to know her 
to love her and to come celebrate with her even today. So, on the behalf of your son, His Royal Majesty, of our children of Nia and our family, and all the many children that you have uh, present here, we thank the Lord for your life. We thank you for what you will yet do. We thank you for keeping you strong, for keeping you vibrant, for very many more years to come. So, ladies and gentlemen, our time, I, I know yes. this last tense, if you would all rise with me as we cut this beautiful cake together My apologies. With, uh, My apologies. Well done. And um, very quickly, as I spell the name of Jesus, who has been a keeper, who will keep her for very many more years to come, who will, who will shower her with his blessing, who will continue to keep her post enlarged, even in old age, flourishing every sense of that word. So um, I will spell Jesus, and then you will spell it along with me. And um, at uh, the last S, we will all shout uh, congratulations. We will all give me an E. e. Give me a S. Yes. And a U. U. And now give me an S. Yes. A supersonic S. Yes. A shout hallelujah. Yes. A shout praise the Lord. Yes. Let's thank the Lord for our mommy great yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Let's give the Lord a hand for it. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations, mommy. Very, very glorious return. Thank you. 